from where I know you. Make a video. I don't want to make a video. Make a good video. I don't know what video to make. I was like, oh. well, just make any video you can. Well, they don't care. Stop talking to yourself. I'm not talking to myself. Yes, you are. I can hear you talking right now. You're talking to yourself. It's crazy. You know, um, I'm just going to go on a limb and say that the, the, as someone who's recently and long acquainted with the types of deep inner angst, guilt, and self-doubt that come from operating on the edge of society, so socially and financially, um, that the socialization process, which is another factor of, of how the world is run, is an anti-socialization process. So that most people and most of their connecting um, is not connecting in a helpful way on every level. And, um, there's no way that I can support that kind of claim. But I can say that in my experience, noticing how people behave around me, and how people approach me in nature, um, where I can understand why animals avoid people. Uh, a lot of animals would, or, or even avoid me, uh, because they just don't feel comfortable with the energy. There's something that can be missing about a person. And I don't like the word person, but I'm gonna use it anyway, because I don't know what else to call them. It's not, again, a made up word it's not very nice to people, I don't think. But there's something that's funny. I just said that, and I just saw a square and compass uh, appear right down in this part of your screen. Yeah. Ener the energy, what that is, is just the energy, the mental energy of what's constructed the world. And why I'm able to intuit often so many things about it. And I had a real confirmation of an intuition that God was actually the top of a... a, a a criminal corporation that controls all the corporations of the world. And sure enough, I'm watching a video and the guy's basically spelling out in detail how that works. Um, that uh, I, I can feel things um, and see things around me. And um, I don't have a huge guide, but fairies have been appearing to me. A lot of the purple ones lately. And, their message to me from the beginning is to do with the heart and just that I deserve to find places in the world where my heart feels safe. And if my heart feels safe, then joy will enter my heart. And uh, it's also the message of the hummingbird. And I shan't forget it. It's not enough sometimes until you like you spell it out for yourself. Um, so the socialization process to me is, is an unsocialization or desocialization process because when I meet people in nature, it's like roommates I've had. You don't know that something's missing until you, you don't know something's important until you see what happens when it's missing. It becomes noticeable by its absence. And there are many, many people, I talk about demonic influences. I'll be at a beach, I'll be walking in nature, out in the forest. And something about being out there puts me in touch with my senses, my animal senses quite a bit, and my heart and my, my emotions. And it's so impossible not to notice how many people, men and women, are not connected at all. And it makes you wonder, in this vast world of ours, how disconnected people are on a daily basis as part of socialization. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's probably um, a less important or greater minority than the willfully, gainfully unemployed. You're not going to see an ad on TV that's like, oh, look at Joe and Jolene. They're living on welfare and they're doing just fine. They don't have uh, irreparable cars parked in their garden. They don't have the remains of a meth lab in their garage. They don't have garbage all around their house. They don't look like poor people. But Joe and Jolene live off of the residuals of all of the robbing going on and all of the jobbing going on, the robbing and the jobbing, the churching and the learning and the working. Not that the money they get is worth anything more than the money other people get, but that it's sheer worthlessness is compensated for or 
the great energy they put into every area of their life because that money is not the primary element, but it's important as far as it goes. So that their minds have a lot of time to occupy themselves on things. And as long as they maintain a healthy relationship with the money, so they don't have to give it much thought. And their life goes in such a way that where as they're able to apportion their energy in intelligent ways for their life, the money just always happens to be there. And it may just be that one can live an intelligent, joyful life without having nearly as much money as people think they do. But it may be that it's a very difficult experiment to perform for most people because they would have to, among other things, de-socialize themselves and de-cult themselves. I've seen people who get sick who lose all of their friends, friends they've even had for long, long, many years of their life, and say, you know what, I found out who my friends really were. It's, I'm not the only one that finds out that their friends aren't terribly friendly. And not even that they're the most awful people, but maybe none of us were ever properly socialized. Our, our energies aren't connecting in a natural way. We didn't meet under normal circumstances. Um, so uh, I guess that was one point I was going to make for this video. Still recovering from my uh, stomach flu, doing well. I just I mention it because it's topical. I, I can't make the kind of videos that I want. And I deeply question whether or not I should be making these videos at all, quite frankly. Other than, you know, maybe it gets to the point where I just don't know what else to do with myself. Uh, oh, it's fine to say that they're urinals and I like to talk to myself and all that sort of thing. But uh, if I'm if I'm honest at all, uh, I, I should also say that I'm very concerned about making my life more productive and bringing more joy into my life. I've said that many times. And uh, I don't know why the solution always is to find more solitude in nature, but it, it often seems to be that way. I think I'm going to be just hiking up the coast for a few days or a few weeks and just staying as close to, like staying on the land without getting one of these public transport ships and going somewhere, just going out my door and just finding the closest place I can get away, which is down the coast because I live near the beach. Uh, I don't know how long that will suffice or whether or not that will interest me enough, but it is spring, so it, it might be a wonderful place to spend the spring, assuming it warms up at any point. But that doesn't solve all of my problems. I've always had what I need. Um, but it's hard for me to believe that I have everything that I need. But there are things that one can need that one can't get. Um, there are people who are intuitive enough to notice. Some of them make the mistake of trying to correct the deficiency in me. Just that uh, not having an appropriate connection with my mother or father throughout all of my formative years and most of my adulthood has affected me. And I don't want to make more of it than it is, but quite frankly, most of the time, I think I make the error of making less of it than it is, actually, as I think most people might. Um, when I was sick the other day, it moved me deeply. And uh, part of me, some gut-wrenching sadness, just I could never, ever make up for the loss of my mother or the loss of my mother in my life have my mother around me now but it's there's always seems to be a loss I said to my mom I said are you sad all the time when I find you said yeah that's why I moved and if I've listened to my mom and I know some of her stories and I know that over time I've learned to really admire my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side and I really feel like I feel a heart to connect into them as I've talked to my grandpa on the other side and uh, just very interested in being supportive and strong and just, happy to love and uh, try to communicate that he's surrounded by in a very loving uh, environment and, and uh, would want uh, his daughter and her son to be happy. And that, that type of conversation is also like the sun to me. It's like talking to the sun. So my, my ancestors lived in the sun. So when I think of the warmth of the sun, the sun was complete as a concept to me throughout my years as the sun conveyed the warmth of my family. And as the warmth of my family faded, 
And I think maybe that's the reason a lot of people don't really look at the sun. They don't seem to revere the sun like I do. And I look at the sun, you know, I'm hoping the sun will teach me, warm me, bring joy to my life. And then often I'll look away from the sun and think, wow, the sun has given me all this wonderful nature. There's so much life in the streams and the sky and the soft air. So much that's joyful that runs through the earth. And as he says, Chief Dan George says in one of his poems, a life that will always exist. Something that will will never go away. Something that never goes away. Joyful in the living existence that never goes away. And I, I would be a student of that man. I would be a, a brother. I would have him as a grand, grand, great grandfather. He opened up my heart. I think it was after reading The Heart Soars that I started to be able to communicate a little bit better with my ancestors. But I remain somber. And uh, it's weird. I, I feel like sadness for me is like um, a personal failing. I think I grew up in a family where sadness was a, was a failing. You know, it, it, it had to be a failing. You either distance yourself from it, you know, make a life for yourself. A lot of my siblings did. They got away, made a life for themselves. Um, found other things to do. And it's true. I mean, I suppose there are people out there that would say, you know, this is why Lane Griffin's channel might be why I don't give up my job because... While there are many good reasons to focus on the things that he does, it's just so easy to get caught into a gravity well of sadness and despair. And even if people would brag that they don't feel the despair that I do, perhaps throughout my life, um, it, they would they would do so precisely because they're so they ride the edge of it all of the time. And that it may be fair to say that most human beings do on some level or will at some level. I wouldn't condemn someone to it. If it was to take from my emotional experience and say someone has to, I just, it doesn't serve me if other people arrive. It would serve me if other people didn't have despair. I mean, if, if, if there's some people out there that don't have some kind of despair or think there may be some kind of despair to their life or have a dimension of their life, which is an odd admission, but in a sense it could be quite pleasant because, I mean, for me it just means recognizing that someone might have found a way to be happier than I, than I am. And maybe if I make some shifts in my mental outlook, I could be happy too. I mean, that's what gurus are always selling, right? So you know that people, like, they think, oh, I just want to shift my attitude. I just need to get that energy, that focus, find someone who's done that, and putting out that energy consistently. Be positive, do this, blah, blah, blah. Oh, don't worry about that. You had a problem. Oh, your, your mother died when you were three, or you saw your father shoot himself with a shotgun when you were 12. Why does that make you feel? Oh, I, I feel like I'm going to die, or my heart's going to stop beating. Okay, now to just release that energy. Just let it flow back into your lungs. And how would you feel if that energy was just all gone as I have to breathe? All right, well, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Oh, look at that. Look at that. You're healed. <laughs> I don't know. I'm 45 years old. I don't know how people heal from the kinds of sadness that run through this world. I don't know. I don't have a fucking clue. I spend my days and nights up to my armpits in sadness, and not just my own, in the behavior of the whole human race around me. I mean, how but a very sad, not as a pejorative, by the way, I've started this video off talking about my own sadness, what but a very sad people would live the way everyone in the world does. I mean, take all the value, I'd say everything has a fair measure of golden, golden crusted value. I would say that with no sarcasm, just because there's a spirit of life and the spirit of men and women in there on any level, Let's not destroy that. You give people laughter, you give people services, you know, people for all the, the horrors of all the different systems of the world and all the horrors they represent a million times fold here and there. There are people who, who often are quite satisfied, whose lives might be saved, whose days might be made, and all kinds of things by all the different types of labor organized in the world. Take, taking that and preserving that, the world's a very sad place still, right? It's just about adding it up. It's still pretty sad. Um, you got pretty people who are ugly people on TV who represent ugly things. And this ugliness constitutes something like what I would call this disconnected from nature. So you get a new nature, you get a new life. So you're getting a being, a man or woman, who's meant to connect to a living environment, 
is now conditioned to connecting to largely non-living and not just incidentally non-living, you know, as they're around physical things and staplers and, and paper clips, but non-living also because it's meant to be a particularly non-living zone in your existence. So they're passing through the valley of the shadow of death. That's their whole lives. Right? The womb of their mother led them into the shadow of the valley of death, and the womb of their death will, will, will escort them out of it, and even the evidence of their life will be evidence claimed by the rulers of the land of the dead. Somebody, uh, when I was about 10, 11 years old, I was outside the school on the soccer field walking around, and a, a girl named Tara Johnson, who had taken some kind of dislike to me, as men and women continue to do so throughout my life, and started calling me Land of the Dead. I lived in an abusive home. I was probably really drunk that day, probably didn't sleep that well. Or, but it wasn't like she was saying, I look like that today. She was like, that's what she, she had decided that I was. So I've always had people looking at me. I don't know why they're so interested in me at all. I never felt like an interesting person. Um, I may be aware that I seem interesting to other people, but I never understand completely what interests me, what interests them about me, because they never seem that interested in me. And if they're either not interested, or they know all too much about me without having to talk about me, or they know all too little about me in the case of extended family. So, So I wonder, you know, what kinds of changes being made that people live in a normal human world ruled by non-living or dead languages, languages of the dead, and the dead keep it, you know, the dead keep those languages going. So many weird words. A job is meant to be a form of torture. That's what a job means. <laughs> That's what a job is. It's a form of torture. Legally, it's a form of torture. That's what a job is. If you go and look at the definitions of these words, maybe that's why it's called the blowjob, because it's torture. <laughs> it's funny. We have to laugh, do we not? <laughs> I've been able to laugh today, which is like an amazing thing for me, because I just... I'm one of those people, they don't get so depressed, they actually like kill themselves, but... <laughs> And I have the capacity for joy, but I do carry a considerable sadness inside of me, and I don't take antidepressants. In fact, contacting that emotion of sadness while I've been sick has been very important to my life. And, and even that seems sad. It's like, wow, it's like a joyful part of your life is, is feeling incredibly fucking sad about your estranged father and family. It's like, wow, aren't you a fucking piece of work? Forget jobs being torture. Your life is torture. <laughs> and it's like, well, maybe you're right. Maybe something about the job, or the language of the job, and the language of the dead, and the, the people going to work and getting paid with no money. Now, as I said to my mom, let's say the money is worthless. Let's say you, you form a contract with a job to, to work in exchange for something that's useless in return. Pure slave. Though the money may be rendered worthless in many different degrees, could not that same money be rendered valuable if you, you put it in the right place in your life? Which, by the way, most people probably couldn't do, but let's just say like, it's, a, it, it's an actual challenge. It's like um, Jeopardy. It's like a challenge. And you can actually put money of various denominations in the proper place in your life. I'm learning to do that. So I live on a passive income and or welfare, and I live quite well. I'm not saying I'm the happiest person at all. I've mean, spent most of the videos saying how unhappy I am. But I don't fit in with anybody. I don't even fit in with other so-called poor people, many of whom are begging for money or living in fairly inhospitable environments. I don't. So, I mean, how do I interact with someone? Although I can't really interact with anyone at my income or above my income, and no one, very few people have less income than me. So who am I going to interact with? And then the, the, the interesting people or eccentric and sometimes sociopathic people are drawn to my life. Well, helpful from time to time, but generally a huge fucking drain. So much so that at 45, I've now, among the wonderful uh, qualified successes of my life, have been the removal of all of them from my life. So there's sadness in every way. I'm happy to be sad and I'm happy to be alone. And that makes me all very sad. 
And the happiness that creeps out of that is like, well, maybe I have a chance to have a bit of a different life than I've had, um, safer for my heart. And that part of that would be acknowledging that, well, if even the worst people you meet tacitly acknowledge that there's something about you that stands out, it's at least, at least worth accosting in various weird and wonderful demonic ways, um, much of which I've become inured to, but none of which ever fails to drain me a little bit, if only because I continue to be reminded and confronted with that we live in a very world capable of all kinds of shocking behavior that seems to take its provenance in what most people call a normal socialization process. And as a self-proclaimed researcher and anth cultural anthropologist, this is extremely disturbing. So I've chosen a life, I've been a person, I've made a walk, I've made the mistakes, I'm as good or bad as I am, confronts me with a world that, yes, will probably, does a fairly good job of convincing me that it will continually to increase in how hor horrific it appeals to me and how slim the prospects of happiness should really be for most people unless they take on a role of one of the yet to be and presumed dead people who occupy the dead languages with which their laborious lives are orchestrated and taxed. Even though, owing to, yes, indeed, the quintessence and value of what every man and woman turns their mind to in any kind of world that I happen to be talking about, will remain a sustaining value, just like the living existence around us that never goes away. There's something that will always be valuable about that. But understanding in that that is always valuable, there's a lot of stuff that's encrusted that makes a lot of people feel like nothing's that valuable unless they reduce it to the making of money. When you, if you reduce something to the making of money, if there's a reduction in any sense of the current of life that you commit to, say, labor that reduces one's living being, and if, then however much money you get will never be enough to compensate for that. But, like the people who rule this world, you could distribute your losses to subordinate prey. So that's how the part of a, a way of looking at the Ponzi scheme that is the world. At an energetic level, people have to form be a glandular isomorph. <laughs> this, this is an interesting concept for a YouTube video. People have to function as a glandular isomorph, isomorph in order to be a part of the world and distribute the actual costs from the leisure or lying languages, the ledger and lying languages that they are the trustees for in order to move forward or so they think in life. A business that occupies a language essentially that occupies everything that the mind has come to be occupied with as it connects to what is supposed to connect and give signal strength with the, the core living principle and force of their, of their birth, their life, their breath, their heart, their blood. And their joy their knowledge what's worthwhile what they can live with and what they would wish to have more of in their life and how they plan to go about doing it so if my life looked hopelessly confused beset with all kinds of problems which to uh, say make lots of money and be a famous person which I wouldn't want to do necessarily um, but I, I have to acknowledge that I obviously have a place in the world that even stupid human animals, in fact, the stupid ones, seem to notice something about me that seems to be either threaten them or make them want to fuck them. I say to the people all the time, they either want to hate me or fuck me. It happens to me every day. They either want to hate me or fuck me or both. And I don't think even they're sure. They could be men, they could be women. They could be gay, they could be straight. Who knows? And that's how low the mind of people is. Um... But my life is not necessarily any easier than anyone's, if you look at the languages. So the anti-socialization socialization, socialization process works, meaning they are successfully under the spell of the sucking of cess and the distribution of cess. So the sucking and distribution of cess amidst all the other genuine value of the spirit of man that he or she is in whatever situation, in whatever world, and rightfully doing the best that they can. Okay, so all those are a complete idea, and that's how I approach the world. The end of the, the end of the day, the people I meet are not anything but cessful to me. They're not successful. They're suck joyful because they suck the joy out of me. They're suck lifeful. They're they're suck essenceful. They're not successful. They're suck essenceful because their fullness 
like people in a religion, means they have to continually suck more from people in order to prove, right, the leisure which they are serving, that it must constantly get more from its environment and distribute more of the waste products more successfully. So a person in a religion is never satisfied. They don't even believe their own religion because they know down deep that it's a leisure of lies. And they, they're trustees of a leisure for which they become responsible. And a leisure that involves the conversion of the, the birthright of the Son of Man, taken as a number, let's say $12 billion, which is what the system assigns to you, and converts that into something of uh, a debt that can never be paid. So you're actually taking on the debt of your master. So technically, the master witches of the world have decided that if you were to exercise your right to demand an actual reward commensurate with the difficulties with which to uh, execute your, your duties as a trustee of a partial profile of their leisure and the glandular isomorphic function of distributing various times of poison and perversions of language and human communication, you could ask for $12 billion. That's basically what that means uh, in terms of compensation. That's how much it's worth to them for what you're doing in terms of the electromagnetics of the monetary system, which is not the electromagnetics of life necessarily. You could choose any number you want, but they've chosen $12 billion. That's how much it's worth in terms of the actual workings of the financial system. So you're not getting enough money probably, right? sitting there for every born child there's a 12 billion dollar account now the important thing is not necessarily that you have to access it although there's people who say they know how to do that um, I think the important thing is as much as you can do psychologically and for me the scary part is that I've been trying to do that for 45 years and I don't feel like I've made a least bit of a dent in it of course the strange and sort of infantile mistake that I'm making is I am continuing, obviously, to look for feedback from the world as to the growth of a mind that is decidedly averse to becoming socialized to its anti-socialization system. And that as I continue to be diplomatic with the various, basically most people are just like uh, evangelical Christians. They represent the system. And if they meet someone who's not in the system, they tend to evangelize, they tend to feel strong compulsion, either by threat, love, or lust, to distribute something to me. <laughs> Waste products, tacit admiration, fear, threat, you name it. They just don't seem to know how to talk to me. So with the this is this is, you know, you see people acting strange in cults. Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Look at how people act based on the cult of the world Vatican Judaic global order. And the dead Latin and the dog Latin and the dead English that's used to control people like people of the dead, the land of the dead, so, uh, which is kept by God. It's an interesting thing in uh, Forrest Gump, for instance. Um, I see things on like this on TV all the time now. There's a, t a, a scene, uh, if you ever watched the movie Forrest Gump, where Major Dan um, is a strong, vigorous, virile uh, lieutenant in the Vietnam War whose legs are blown off. And when Forrest Gump, who does a short stint in Vietnam under... Lieutenant Dan's command later sees him stateside, or back in the United States of America, the dummy corporation uh, for the slave colony that is America. Um, he doesn't, have, none of whom have any rights, they just have privileges that are granted them as trustees of a leisure, which is basically a book of lies, serpent book of lies, that they will spend their lives emulating and uh, executing without ever getting anything in return whatever other job that they do. So, I mean, you're doing more than your job, essentially. Right? If you could just do your job, right, wherever you are, if you just could do your job and you could get the compensation that you need and you keep mindful not to give too much to your job or to depend, you know, or to give so much to your job that it's worth enough to you to pay attention to the fact that the money's not gonna give you an adequate reward. You better be getting other things back from it as well. 
and you and, and if you're going to be giving a lot of your time say at a desk you're going to be giving your physical well-being for the rest of your life so i meet a lot of people who retire from working at a desk if you've given up your life you're committing a very slow suicide working at a desk for 40 hours a week okay think of schools they put kids perfectly healthy children in desks for six seven eight hours a day like that is pure torture and yet you never get any kinesiologist, no doctor, no health guru who says, I'm trying to help the world be healthy, you know, um, never says like, it's fucking torture. You're putting these incredible animals like deer in like a little pen for six, seven hours a day. Now, the thing about children and the thing about men and women is that we can actually deal with that. There are animals that can't. That's what makes us useful to our masters because we will mentally change to accommodate that. We're like, ooh, okay. I don't get to move around, but ooh, maybe I could do this. I can be aggressive. I can form antisocial behavior, and I can find the antisocial behavior that's most socially acceptable. <gasps> Lo and behold, that seems to match my mom and dad's behavior. <clears throat> Whether I get rewarded or not, they'll respect me. Here we go. What are you going to do? Like You assume that your mom and dad were free agents, if you will, and were equipped to pass on to you something that had... Uh, a lot of congruence with the current of life, but because they live by the dead language of the banks, and not entirely so because there are mitigating forces because we are men, and whatever consent we give is not a consent that could be given by a complete slave, and so we can never actually be a complete slave, which is why we can actually suffer from slavery. Because if, we, if, we, if the more you love it, the more of a complete slave you are, right? So if you don't like your job, or you don't like working for the world, it's because you're not a complete slave. Because your consent was actually required. However, involuntary given, by the way, it's not actually legitimate to begin with. <laughs> so, you know, the long and short of it is, getting out is easy. Dealing with the grief is not. Right? It's like you get out of a war, for instance. Say you, you get out of a war, you finally get injured, you get sent home like Lieutenant Dan. But it's just the beginning of your problems, isn't it? You finally retire, and now all these health problems come in. You finally get your freedom, and now you can't even enjoy it. Whenever you get out of the system, however you get out of the system, it's hard to enjoy it. And the one big mistake I think people make is they don't deal with the grief. They don't deal with the manifold problems mentally, not necessarily your own, because now you've entered a field of being that's, that by nature, if you're doing it right, should be incongruent with much of the world around you. Not all of it. There's no need to be a complete fucking raving lunatic, but there will, there will always be people in your life, family, friends, who would deeply begin to be threatened by that, and they will on instinct attempt to distribute the success of your religion, which, as far as you're concerned, means that you should feel like a total piece of cess. If you don't suck the cess that one has to suck so that you become a better sex distrib cess distributor, success distributor. Right? And uh, no matter how many salesmen people meet, it never seems to be enough for them. No matter how many weird fucking Judaic perversions of our life, it never seems to be enough for people to go, you know, maybe we're not just a completely cess drinking creature. <laughs> maybe there was something else. So the bank's control that current and your parents are working for that control regulatory system, their isomorphic glands of a cess distribution system to help make you successful. And so all of the socialization becomes an anti-socialization process that only gets ratified as anything social, certainly as this is represented by various priests of new age and, and other cults, um, because it's so it's reached such a, a great amount of penetration throughout the society. It's actually antisocial. Everything people are taught in psychology is antisocial. Everything people learn in society is antisocial. That's why animals are scared of people. They're crazy. I was watching a video of like people in a safari in Africa, and I'll finish the Lieutenant Dan story, by the way. And these elephants are just doing their private lives, and they're not private, sorry, that's another stupid word. Uh, they're living their, their lives on the, wherever they are in these savannas, and they're, they're stampeding, and they're all in this thing taking pictures. And one of the elephants runs up as if to say, you know, get the fuck away from here. They don't hurt them, just say, get the fuck away from here. And he goes, and they come, and another elephant comes up, get the fuck away from here. And three times, and they're just like, oh, it's okay, keep quiet. And, they go, and it's like, this is why animals don't like people. What the fuck are you doing? I'll tell you what, you get out of that fucking thing. You put away the fucking camera and go spend some time with those elephants, hey? You stupid 
cowardly fucking people. Learn to approach these creatures. So when you approach by a car, you haven't approached properly. Right? You're not prepared. In fact, it's dangerous for you and for them. Just like when I'm in nature and someone approaches me improperly, because mostly everyone in society has the wrong energy because they're not connecting to nature and the living language of nature, they still have something. That's, good. That's why they're alive. That's why all of their labor, no matter how indefatigably wasteful, at least that it is as part of a Catholic criminal system, still has some redeeming value. But to use that redeeming value, as it often is, to justify continuing and increasing the system's excess distribution, as though any slight profile of, of, of the, the success of, of, of this industrial way of living is evidence that it, can't, it should not possibly be arrested in any of its fundamental conceits. And it's so easy to make that case because people work them so hard they don't have the time to even think about it. All arbitrary. So Lieutenant Dan rendered a parachute Paralegic, he's become an alcoholic, so he finds himself on one of Forrest Gump's fishing boats, lashes himself to the top of the mast during a huge storm. Uh, I don't know if it's a hurricane, I guess it's a hurricane. And he's like, fuck you, God, fuck you, Yahweh, uh, you, this is the best you can get. Yeah, fucking pieces, you know, I can take anyone, this is it. Uh, you're nothing, man, you're nothing. You know, having his out with God. But this is God the devil. This is not just God, this is God the devil that creates hurricanes. So it's just interesting that the representation of God as a storm, as an evil energy. I just I just thought, I don't know why it took so long to tell that story. And just things that, that pop into my head, not because it's necessarily the most evil thing you've ever seen on a, on a cinema screen, but it hints at a very Kabbalistic approach, very Gnostic approach to uh, knowledge. There are a lot of things in nature that may be different, but they're not necessarily contradictory. I mean, life or living existence works because no matter what world you live in, however you get spit out into this moment, or whatever joy you eventually get spit out into, even if it's at the, you know, beyond the last days of your particularly physical existence in this particular life, you, you are effectively born from joy. Now, this concept, I think, is misused a lot in the New Age and things like that. The New Age, they like to talk about contracts. You know, you have soul contracts. It's like, you know what contracts are doing? They're doing money. Why do they use the word soul contracts in, in New Age psychology and so forth? Right? Because life is a contract. Your life is a contract. They love to throw contracts at you. It's like, I don't have a contract for anything. I have my existence as it's unfolding, and it's up to me to decide what it means. It certainly has purpose and meaning to it, but it's not always clear to me what that is. And it's, it can be more or less problematic in a world that isn't that interested in encouraging people to be uh, connected and emotional and honest about how their existence is going. Um, in light of which, which is maybe a good reason why they don't examine it, it may seem that their existence um, doesn't exist as far as their lives concerned because they have so many contracts to fulfill. Everything's a contract. So every relationship in their life is essentially decided by one lady, Felicity Kelly, she was in Hinduism. She's like, oh, everything in your life is decided by the lords of karma. And you, before you come into the world, the lords of karma basically decide. You can see the, the sort of moral ambivalence that can come in here, the sociopathy and moral. The lords of karma decide whether you're going to get blown to bits or whether you're going to be a handicap or whether you're going to be Down syndrome or whether or not you're just going to have, you know, a fucking auto accident that kills your firstborn child. The lords of karma decide that. So every tragic thing, the lords of karma have consulted with you and there's been a contract made and this is how you're going to advance um, your, how you're going to balance out your debt. So again, business and debt. Karma gets involved with debt. So we see all the religions actually behind them really are just metaphysical businesses that use conceits about who is the creditor and who is the debtor. And you always owe something. You're always behind. You always have something to make up for. You're a jiva. You're a sinner. You're an infidel. You're a goy. You were born back or low or poor with something to prove and perform. It's never you're born with a twelve hundred dollar billion dollar hair at birthright. You have the right of ownership, more or less, 
depending on how you look at it, of all of the minerals and resources around you, the phys- all the basis of physical existence, and all of the trappings of the corporate world, as I, as I try to understand them, um, are really claims being made by people who fundamentally know, which is interesting because you wouldn't think they would have to make such a distinction, that they have to apply a seaborne system of law, a seaborne claim upon you that can only be derived by inviting you onto their ship when it is in dry dock. So the courts and libraries and schools around you are all dry docked ships and they're running the laws of people who believe that their god is the god of the ocean that they've concocted for themselves. Poseidon or whatever. Could be an electrical ocean. For instance, like Zeus, the god of an electrical ocean. And you notice that even in Buddhism, they'll say, like, to, you know, like the Buddha, you'll, if you talk to Buddhists, right, the Buddha can be represented as a woman. And different, like Shiva and Shanti, you can be transgendered. It's always like that because all these religions are all created by Masons. And I'll just end with this note again. The devil is impotent. God is a creation of the devil in a way, or what is most evil, and against nature. And not necessarily evil, evil, nature doesn't have evil, but this evil is against even the evil of nature. It's against every living language. And it's impotent. So it's interesting that it's found a way to make itself the creator of everything. Even though, as I said, if a, a representative or isomorphic gland of the Catholic Judaic complex walked into a tribe of true native people without genitalia <laughs> or just something pasted on and then said, I'd like you to live the way I tell you to. You'll be really happy. Um, I'm in the image of my God. And my God is the creator of all existence. He creates the Big Bang, evolution, all knowledge, and I can control everyone in the world. You just have to listen to me. And for those people who value their potency and their fertility, there must be something that just grates on people every day of their lives, that this nature, this living existence that never goes away. Continues to live, but doesn't live very clearly in everything that they're giving their life for in exchange for money, which may be fine in itself, but Maybe you're giving too much, and maybe you've given up the ability because you rely on money so much as a reward in the different ranks that come with it, so much so that as someone who is gainfully unemployed, a lot of people would probably feel justified in saying, you know what, you can expect to receive all kinds of difficult energy from people, you know, and all the more reason to go get a job, and that's the way life works. It's like, well, why should that be? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm taking, you know, worst case examples because run into some fairly scummy energy from time to time. And not necessarily because I'm unemployed, but also, as I said, because I guess I just I give a certain energy to people. So it's my job to, to work on that because uh, I have a lot of emotions uh, touched off by my father and many of my, uh, many, much of the bereavement, I guess, that I could say my family suffered from unknowingly because living lives in the world that they do, they don't deal with it at all. And they're never given any encouragement to do so. It doesn't take a special religion, it doesn't take a special book. I think it takes a willingness and a courage with which we were born, you know, being like a child.